quantum theory can't be refuted in this way. The Copenhagen interpretation of the theory is not based on experimental evidence, and so it cannot be refuted by experimental evidence. Think of it this way. Einstein, like Schrodinger, was attempting to reduce the theory to absurdity. But the quantum theory is invulnerable to such an attempt because it is already explicitly absurd as stated by its advocates. The attitude of Bohr and Heisenberg is like that expressed by Father Tertullian in his defense of religious miracles. They believe it because it is absurd. They have been emancipated from reality and logic. Remember Bohr's famous words. So the approach of Einstein and Schrodinger was doomed from the outset. And congratulations, because the Electric Universe conferences are perhaps the only real conferences to come to if you want to learn about science. I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. Look, but guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide, with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, that people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm, so what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it's, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from uh, the, the state of Illinois. Uh, so this podcast and everything found on the website is covered by Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. Uh, but for this episode, I'm going to make an exception. Uh, even if you are a uh, you know, government scientist funded via taxation, you can do whatever the hell you want with this episode. Uh, so I, I don't really make exceptions that often. So uh, that is a uh, pretty major one. Uh, so nonetheless, I have an, an extremely interesting episode for you today. Recently, you heard my two-part series with Daryl Becker on the philosophic corruption of reality and an introduction to the electric universe. Uh, so the latter part of that hopefully piqued your interest and drove you to investigate further uh, if you did, this uh, interview today uh, will make uh, you know this guest even more fascinating. So I'm joined by Walt Thornhill, a physicist from Australia, and uh, one of the biggest proponents and experts on the electric universe theory. Uh, he runs a website, holoscience.com, that's H-O-L-O, science.com, a terrific, highly informative website. Uh, so if you're new to this subject, uh, he does have a synopsis tab, which will provide you with uh, overviews of the issues with the mainstream model, uh, as well as the EU viewpoint. And uh, when we say EU today, I want to make it clear we're uh, obviously not referring to the European Union. We're talking about the electric universe. Uh, so, Wal, welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, sir. It's, uh, an, absolute, it's an absolute honor to be uh, talking with you now. I've been following your work for, uh, for a few years off and on uh, until the past couple of months when I've really you know, dug into the, uh, the EU theory. So, uh, welcome to the show, sir. Uh, how are you doing today? Thanks very much, Shane, for having me on. Um, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Great, great. So, so with discussions such as these, and the listeners, have, this will be probably the third time uh, the listeners hear this by now, but I'd like to start with uh, one of Ayn Rand's best quotes uh, from her 1929 journal. She said, I have to study philosophy, higher mathematics, physics, psychology. As to physics, learn why mind and reason are so decried as impotent when coping with the universe. Isn't there some huge mistake there, end quote. So to begin, uh, what do you think, Wall? Was uh, something very wrong with physics in 1929? Yes, I think there was. Uh, I would consider it to be a kind of escape from reality. Uh, for instance, uh, Salvador Dali, the famous um, surrealist painter, 
was said to have been inspired by Einstein and his theory of relativity. And uh, as a result, Dali uh, painted his melting clocks and weird landscapes. Uh, so I would consider that the effect of the stresses of, and the destruction of the First World War was part and parcel of the um, psychology behind trying to escape from reality. Uh, because what Einstein did in effect was to remove our standards of measurement, both time and space, and, and made them malleable and uh, subject to a choice of a favoured observer, which means that uh, it was almost unfalsifiable, yet it was meaningless. Right, right, and and yeah, you're 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 exactly right, uh, and I've I've I'm sh I've I've heard you mention him in one of your presentations. And before we kind of go into your background, I think it was uh, the one on the elegant simplicity of the electric universe. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. David Harriman in the last uh, series of episodes we've done. Uh, we talked about his philosophic corruption of physics uh, lecture series. So I heard you mention him. So I, I guess uh, have you heard that lecture, uh, the philosophic corruption of reality, and uh, you know how has his work influenced yours, if at all? Well, I came across David Harriman quite late in the piece, but I have uh, quoted from him a couple of times because uh, essentially he's correct that uh, the philosophers have been excluded from science. Uh, in fact, uh, it was um, our, uh, our man who gave us a, a brief history of time who said that uh, philosophy is dead. Uh, well, it, it is in science, which is unfortunate because physics is actually a um, had its birth in natural philosophy right and the emphasis then was on philosophy in other words asking the deep questions and trying to figure out inductively what it is uh, that we're witnessing what we've ended up with is the philosophers have been excluded the mathematicians have come in and they try and deduce from mathematical principles how the universe works and of course, when you're talking about the universe, we rely on just a few photons from great distances to try and figure that out. And because of that, and the fact that we can't reproduce uh, stars in a laboratory, and we can't um, uh, reproduce what we see in deep space in the laboratory, or at least this is what astronomers think at present, uh, then uh, we have no real checks and balances against their fantasizing their i mean the stories that they cook up now and we have headlines about a pure fantasy right right that's 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 exactly correct and uh, i think it was uh it was uh, kind of the the, the the kantian view of philosophy that it's just the mathematics or of, of physics that it's just the mathematical description of appearances and uh yeah. mathematics is not uh physics right <laughs> No, no, I think David Harriman uh, makes a lot of very good points about the state of uh, modern science. And the problem is that the education system doesn't uh, give students any idea of the parlous state of their uh, fundamental beliefs in, in science. When you think about it, or when you uh, actually understand the electric universe point of view, which is based more on engineering principles and what you can test and observe in the laboratory, um, you realize that uh, science today has become more or less a virtual reality computer game where scientists sit in front of computers, they program it with their mathematics and whatnot, and they have so many knobs to twiddle that they can produce a virtual reality which looks like what we see in deep space. But of course, because it is virtual reality, it's not real. It has no real meaning. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy that you it's crazy that you have to actually have, have to actually explain that, right? <laughs> it should it should just be blatantly obvious, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, like like it is today. So, as I mentioned to you in pre-show, you probably get asked this question in every interview, and you've done a lot of them. I've been I've been I've been uh, you know listening to a, a bunch of them on YouTube. So I'm sure you can mm. kind of get sick of uh, you know this question, but tell us a bit about uh, your history, your your I guess your uh, your background. Uh, how did you get to the electric universe theory and uh, to where you are today? Well, I'm not actually sick of talking about it because I think it's important uh, because the electric universe is not just a scientific change, it's a cultural change. It requires a change in the way we educate people and the way we view ourselves and our place in the universe. But um, it all started uh, when I was very young, post-war, uh, and in school I was very interested in astronomy, so I used to bore the kids witless during show and tell with things that I'd discovered. And of course, at high school, I thought I was going to be a scientist. 
I had uh, some rather interesting differences in my schooling to what most people would have experienced, and that is that post-war new high schools were being built in the suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. And I was one of the lucky ones who ended up in a new high school in first form, and we were the top form all the way through the school. We had no students above us, which meant that I had good access to our teachers, and in particular, uh, one science teacher who used to lend me books by Fred Hoyle and other scientists uh, to read. And um, the result of that was that I was given more or less two sides to the story. I read Fred Hoyle's Steady State Universe, and then, of course, over the years, I learned about the Big Bang Universe. But the thing that really threw me was, uh, as a teenager, reading uh, Emanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision, which is only the only, I think, recent example of the burning of a well-documented uh, book from a textbook publisher, Macmillan, uh, which was uh, burnt, had to be burnt, remainded, despite the fact that it was a bestseller for six months on the New York uh, Times a bestseller list. Wow. And the reason for that was the extreme pressure brought by astronomers, in particular Harlow Shapley uh, from Harvard and the Harvard clique, who boasted they'd never read the book, but it, it was obviously wrong because it disobeyed Newton's laws. Now, this is the kind of religious aspect of modern science, in particular cosmology, where beliefs uh, drive decisions rather than evidence and scientific investigation. Anyway, the book uh, was transferred to a popular publisher and it is still available today and I think was reprinted just recently. The thing about that book that really inspired me was that he was a fellow who had a broad education, the kind of education you got at the end of the uh, 19th and beginning of the 20th century, which gave you uh, the history and the classics and, as well as the science. And he was a guy who was also trained under one of Freud's pupils as a psychoanalyst. And he began to see that the stories in the creation stories around the world from all different cultures told essentially the same kinds of things. And they were all obsessed with the planetary gods. Right. And he showed me that you could actually use the modern forensic scientific approach to analyzing what was fact and what was fiction amongst these stories. Because of course, uh, it, uh, I mean, it's been noted by many scholars, um, the, uh, uh, myth, myth, mythological scholars, I should say, uh, who are doing comparative mythology that these stories do have common elements. And of course, the idea was that, well, maybe somehow these stories got transferred around the world. But uh, you can't do that with the Australian Aboriginals, for instance, and their stories also have the same characteristics. So he, using this forensic technique, you're able to sort out the best evidence and he showed that you could do it. And uh, the thing that he proved for me was that Venus within human memory was a gigantic archetype of all comets. In other words, it's a new planet in the solar system. From that premise, he then made predictions before the space age, which were quite outrageous at the time, but every every one of them was uh, later shown to be correct. One of them being, of course, that uh, Venus would be shown to be hot, almost incandescent. Hmm. Well, no one, no one thought that when he made that prediction. He also said the moon would have remnant magnetism. No one thought to th uh, actually photograph the um, orientation of the rocks that the Apollo astronauts brought back. And of course, they were surprised that they were magnetized. It just goes on and on. The number of predictions he made uh, that were proven correct. But of course, the scientists uh, involved in those subjects said, oh, just lucky guesses. No, no, <laughs> you can't predict things that are so <laughs> off the wall from lucky guesses and get them all right. So this was the thing that inspired me. But when I went to university, I began asking my lecturers questions related to these subjects. And I found instead of a scientific and dispassionate uh, response, I got hostility. Or at the very least, I got answers that were, didn't refer to what I'd actually asked, but they were answers that they could give to a question that they could answer. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, typical of experts, I'm afraid to say. Uh, they're not prepared very easily to say, I don't know, or that's interesting and I'll look into it. 
I didn't get any of that. I had people, you know, turn on their heels and just walk away without even acknowledging the fact that I'd asked the question. So I began postgraduate research, you know, upper atmosphere research, uh, but I got very disillusioned and realized that as a heretic now, and I was becoming recognized as a heretic, um, there was no future in academia. And so I joined IBM and began uh, a career in computing, which I found the logic of computing and that rather interesting and uh, enjoyable. And so that was my career while I pursued the scientific questions in the background. And I think that sort of wraps up <laughs> where I came from. Very good, very <laughs> but, good. But the story uh, over the years, and I look back at the progress in the ideas, and it's like, it's almost like a random walk, but um, I can chart the progress uh, and the people that I needed to see. And this is one of the aspects of the work that I did because I joined the Australian government after some years in IBM, mainly for the purpose of being able to travel the world and meet the people who I felt would uh, had the right ideas or were on the right track. Right. And it was that that uh, got me to where I am now with the Electric Universe. There are key individuals along the way who provided uh, the next step in the or the next part of the big picture. Very good, very good. And yeah, well, I want to just you know real 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 br briefly mention uh, you know talk about Velikovsky again. I, I was hoping to have read in the beginning and also Worlds in Collision by the time of this uh, interview, but uh, I, I had a chance to read in the beginning. Uh, which I think was published <laughs> after it was. I, don't, I think it was kind of an unfinished manuscript, uh, if I remember correctly, that one of his uh, old research assistants just kind of you know put out. Uh, That's and right. It was. Uh, I mean, I, I I've heard I've heard you mention Velikovsky and others, you know, in kind of the EU circles many times, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll be honest. I mean, I used to be more more into the, this this actually this this uh, podcast kind of was was started based off of kind of consp conspiratorial subjects. And yes. reading Velikovsky's work, uh, like going back into kind of the, I guess maybe the occult sort of understandings of, of, of you know, what they were witnessing, it did kind of answer mm -hmm. some questions that I, you know, I, I hadn't looked, I hadn't looked into that for years now. So it kind yes. of, uh, it, it kind of answered, answered some questions for me that I really didn't intend to get answered. So uh, it's really, <laughs> really fascinating, fascinating stuff. And uh, yeah. it's not what you're told in, uh, in, in school. It's definitely not. Uh, no, so it's important. I, Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to mention that um, our last conference in um, August in Phoenix uh, was a, actually included a day on Velikovsky with some of the people who are still alive now who knew him personally. And I had met him, so I was included. And I talked about Velikovsky's influence in astrophysics because uh, he was the one who provided the key to uh, unlocking the real history of the solar system and the human race. And uh, that's available on the thunderbolts.info website. Uh, and we have all of the videos available and all of last year's um, The Elegant Simplicity of the Electric Universe videos available there for $29 US. Right, right. And I would recommend, uh, you know, the, the listeners, uh, you know, definitely, you know, check that out, especially the Thunderbirds Project. I can spend hours on that site and still have, <laughs> still have you know, years of, of videos to watch. Uh, it's really, really incredible stuff. So Thunderbolts.info and then also uh, Wall's site, holoscience.com. Yeah, my, my, my website, I should say, has sort of um, slowed down to a crawl because most of my activity is aimed at uh, the thunderbolts.info website now so for the most up-to-date material you go to that website very good very good so so we've got about uh, nine minutes until this uh, until this very first break about 10 minutes actually uh, on mm -hmm. truth frequency radio uh so let's let's kind of uh, i guess uh, i'll kind of leave this this I, I do have an outline with a lot of questions but i want to leave this kind of open-ended for you uh, so you can, you know, talk about what you want to talk about. So if you're if you're talking to folks who don't know anything about the EU, wh where do you want to start? I think that uh, the most interesting thing for me was the historical background. In other words, what was it that the human race witnessed that frightened the pants off us and still results in a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder in humankind today? And you can see that in the doomsday scenarios, which we always seem to have. Right. One, uh, one just a few days ago, I think, was another doomsday prediction. Yeah, they're, they're still here with us today. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we've always got to have one. Uh, I've, I've been through uh, asteroid impact um, or comet impact, uh, ice age, 
uh, and now we've got global warming, of course, we're all going to die. Well, where does this fear come from? Also, the fear of comets. I mean, comets, uh, most people um, look at them if they manage to see one. Uh, not all of them are that visible. But to think that that could have had anything to do with the doomsday scenario, the end of the world, the end of life as we know it and everything, uh, it doesn't make any sense unless you actually go back and find out what the ancients were desperately trying to tell us. And they witnessed some really, really, I guess, uh, you know, look at just from Velikovsky's in the beginning, they witnessed, uh, and also just the creation stories, as you mentioned, there was some, mm. some really insane stuff going on. Uh, oh, yes. And, and uh, I, it, I, I think that's that's kind of an interesting perspective there, because there, there is that, uh, that kind of doom porn, uh, those doom porn scenarios always propagated today. There's this... Mm. There's just this, this I guess, innate fear, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe not innate. That kind of leads to a different debate, but, uh, but there, there is kind of that fear for, for the end of the world. Uh, and I think you yes. know, Velikovsky offered some really valuable insight into, well, well just, like where, where did this, where did this fear come from? And well, I guess his hypothesis was that, well, it's something that's kind of ingrained in humanity because of all of the terrible things that you know, uh, that we've had to, you know, go, go through to get to the point we are today. Mm. One of the important aspects of that is that uh, Velikovsky, as a psychoanalyst, knew this. He said that any individual who has suffered uh, trauma that they cannot face up to suppress the memory. But he said subconsciously they try and uh, access it, often by uh, some you know, alternate means uh, and sometimes by reenactment. Well, the alternate means these days is all of the doom and disaster movies we see and, uh, you know, the end of the world type things and we're going to be saved by some hero. All of this is very mythological, right. Bronze Age Bronze Age stuff. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the, the point of that is that the reenactment uh, of these doomsday scenarios is is warlike behavior, it's destruction of your neighbors. You blame them for what happened because you've got no other recourse. You can't get up there and um, fiddle, you know, put the planets back in their right place. Uh, so what do you do? You blame your neighbors and then you go to war and destroy them. Well, we just keep doing it and we've never known why. But once you understand it, Velikovsky felt, unless we understand that, we will never heal from the disasters uh, that uh, occurred to our and uh, you know forgotten ancestors, and that is the most serious message I think he actually had to give us. Forget the science; I mean, the science uh, can take care of itself. It's the impact on the human psyche and the way we behave to each other and to the planet, because we also treat the planet as if uh, we're the gods and we can happily destroy it if we need if we want to. And we've, we have some of that power now with nuclear weapons. So this is the real fear uh, that we should have is ourselves, you know, fear of ourselves. Right, right. Uh, I guess when it doesn't come to science, this is one of the, the issues with kind of the philosophic corruption of, of philosophy, you know. Uh, mm. But, you know, look, looking inward, you know, looking inward rather than projecting those things outward uh, when it comes to, I guess, self-development and, and, and trying to, I guess, heal past wounds. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, and unfortunately, it seems like a lot of that's uh, faced outward. You know, I'm having these problems, therefore I'm going to blame you. I'm going to, you know, we're going to, you know, drone bomb somewhere. Or so, so some some really really ter terrible outcome. Uh, that's right. Yes. So so yeah yeah. Yeah. So uh, that that's a very important aspect of it, uh, and it's one of the inspiring things about the electric universe is that it provides us with a new way of looking at ourselves and the universe. You know, modern science is devoted to try and make us feel safe. This is why uh, one of the reasons why Harlow Shapley and his mob at Harvard uh, wanted uh, Velikovsky's book burnt, because this showed that the solar system is not a safe place necessarily. But of course, appealing to Newton's law doesn't solve anything because Newton's law doesn't give you a safe orderly universe. Uh, any deviation by any one body in that multi-body system is enough to throw the whole thing into chaos. But the astronomers never tell you that. Or if they do, they, they immediately change the subject. Um, there is no mechanism in Newtonian mechanics or in Einstein's gravitational theory to um, institute a stable, multi-bodied orbital system. 
Hmm. Okay. That's that's interesting as well. That's that's uh, certainly interesting as well. So, uh, I guess uh, we we've got about uh, three uh, about uh, four minutes uh, until this uh, until this first break. But uh, I mean, let, let's kind of go ahead and get into some of the some of the components of the electric universe. And uh, you know, whatever one is the easiest to explain, which I'm not sure if that's if that's possible in a few minutes. If not, we can always return to it. But uh, I guess so. Uh, what's what's uh, I guess elements of the electric universe versus kind of the mainstream model? Uh, would you like to dig, dig into first? I mean, uh, the comets, the electric sun. Uh, what do you think? Well, uh, one of the major aspects to understanding the universe is to understand your own star. And it's quite obvious that we don't understand the sun because not one aspect of the observed uh, features of the sun or those features above the sun uh, actually conform or can be deduced from the thermonuclear model. The thermonuclear model has to be um, fiddled with at every step to try and give you what we see. One of the major difficulties is, of course, that um, the idea that the energy is radiating from the core of the sun means that where you can peer through the photosphere, through the bright photosphere, down into a sunspot, it should be even brighter, but it's not, it's dark mm -hmm. underneath. Now this shows there is a serious problem with the model. The other aspect of it is that the corona, which is uh, you know out to a million miles or more from the surface of the sun, rises in temperature to millions of degrees. And the surface of the sun is only between five and six thousand degrees uh, Kelvin. That is like having, uh, you know, <laughs> getting hotter the far further away you move from the fire. It doesn't make any sense at all. No, no. But it does make sense if the some of the energy that is uh, radiated by the sun is coming from the outside. In other words, the sun is a uh, connected to the rest of the galaxy and the power that drives the rotation and the um, central activity in the uh, galactic core, some of that energy is uh, participated in by all of the stars. And I've described it as stars being like street lights, uh, charting the main power lines running into the center of the galaxy. Huh. And uh, we are now running an experiment which is testing this idea because this model is far simpler than the thermonuclear model. And what's better, it can be tested by electrical engineers and scientists in the laboratory. So we are doing that right now. That's 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 incredible. And that's one of the things that really, you know, I guess it's what it always drew me to to the electric universe, but especially in the past couple of months where these ideas are you, you can actually test these. And in, 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 as you said, in, mm. in a lab, laboratory, uh, yes. whereas with. Uh, with these, uh, you know, the, these mathematical equations, these mathematical models, uh, you can't really test this. <laughs> so, so there's no. that, there's that kind of uh, Newtonian observational, uh, you know, that what what science is supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be, uh, you know, mm -hmm. look, you know, looking outward to see what's going on and trying to understand uh, what's going on, not, uh, uh, you know, what uh, you know modern physics is uh, is doing today. Uh, so we are up to this yes. first break here on True Frequency Radio. Uh, when we come back, uh, we'll definitely get back, uh, you know, if there's anything else on the electric sun. And also want to get into uh, the redshift blue shift, you know, something controversial, you know, the Big Bang Theory. So uh, when we come back, we'll definitely get into that. Stay tuned. And welcome back to Liberty Under Attack Radio. If you're just joining us, uh, you really need to go back to the archives and listen to the first half of my discussion with Wolf Thornhill, uh, a physicist from Australia and a uh, you know a big proponent, and I would say an expert on the electric universe theory. Uh, you can do so at truthfrequencyradio.com and uh, just uh, you know search for Liberty Under Attack. You can find the archives there, or you can go to libertyunderattack.com and uh, subscribe to the podcast feed or uh, or whatever you guys know where to find the show. So uh, when we were talking, you know, here in this uh, in, in this break wall. Uh, you know the so so the 2015 I think it was uh, the 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 conference was uh, I guess titled uh, the elegant simplicity of the electric universe, and that's one thing that's really really appealed to me about about this theory is because uh, you, when you watch like uh, like say the the universe uh, you hear Morgan Freeman talk about uh, you know uh, what's going on out there. Uh, you know the scientists mm -hmm. don't know, especially when it gets to things like uh, uh, like the uh, the wave particle duality. The wave particle duality. It's like, yeah, we don't know. We have no idea whatsoever what's going on there. Uh, and then you know, in a, in, you know, in black holes. Well, this is what we this is what we think is happening. We we don't know what we we just don't know. We I mean we we don't know what uh, would be in what would uh, actually occur at the event horizon and all of those things. So, you know, even the scientists don't really know what's going on in the standard model. But with the electric universe. 
things become quite simple and it doesn't require uh, it doesn't require a PhD in physics. It doesn't require uh, you know going to school for for eight, 10, 12 years double majoring or whatever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. It just it, re it requires common sense. It aligns to you know our common sense, whereas you know the standard model really doesn't. And that's why uh, I think a lot of people are deterred away from from those fields is because of that complication, uh, and that obviously translates into a, a lesser understanding of uh, of the universe around us. Yes, I think uh, this is where the education system breaks down. It makes far more sense to give a broad education so that people can see the connection between things. Uh, at present, the specialization or the over specialization is such that you end up with a very blinkered uh, view of uh, your particular subject and you don't even recognize that maybe the answer to your problem lies just down the corridor in some other specialty. Uh, <clears throat> there was a um, a psychologist uh, in England who's uh, become rather well known recently, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, and uh, he's pointed out that this kind of tunnel vision that's in, induced in students is rather like uh, chickens who, um, you know, know how to find their food by pecking amongst the grass and finding the seeds. <laughs> but they're not aware of their surroundings so they uh, become you know they know how to find their lunch but they're in great danger of becoming somebody else's lunch <laughs> well right. in uh, the case of the specialists and the experts in uh, those specialties they are in danger of becoming um, our lunch because <laughs> they cannot see the connections and one of the aspects of that too is the overemphasis on mathematics. Mathematics is not necessarily anything to do with physics. It's a tool which can be used by physicists once you have all of the concepts, the physical concepts in place, and you've made sense of those. Once you've done that, then the mathematics can uh, be an extremely useful tool. And uh, in, in that sense, mathematics is very much a part of science, but as a tool, not as a leading um, it, it can't be used as an inductive tool, one where you uh, figure out what's working by sitting back and thinking about all of the components and how they operate together. Anyway, having said that, um, the elegant simplicity of the electric universe is that it adheres largely to engineering principles and to uh, experiment and observation. And this is quite distinct from modern physics where people um, run into some pro theoretical problem on their computer and so they figure out well we need a new particle or we need a new force and so they introduce that with the object generally of getting a Nobel Prize for it. So the Nobel Prizes actually work against uh, simplifying science which is what the 19th, 18th and 19th century scientists were all about, simplifying things. And the electric universe has shown that uh, you can produce a very simple model where you reduce all of the forces, you know, magnetism, gravity, the nuclear force, and so on, down to one, the electric force. And it manifests in all of these other ways simply as a, a result of the structure of matter. And of course, uh, matter in physics is a mystery. We have no idea how it's created. In fact, to talk of the creation and annihilation of matter doesn't make any sense in physics. It disobeys one of the principles of physics. It's magic. And yet it's often talked about. We talk about antimatter. Well, there can be no such thing because you cannot annihilate matter. I call it mirror matter. In other words, it's a mirror version of uh, the form that we're familiar with. That's all. Right. <clears throat> so the electric universe tries to adhere to the principles of physics and to engineering principles. And the result of that is that it's possible, it has been possible to uh, not only figure out how things might work simply, but also to make predictions about what would be found when certain experiments were done or certain space uh, uh, shots were uh, successful. And uh, this has certainly proved to be the case with the electric universe. In some instances, I've been the only one on planet Earth who has predicted successfully what would be found in some of the space shots, for instance. Right, right. That that's yeah. That's 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 you know that's certainly some fascinating stuff. And that was that was something that I noticed watching 
uh, you know, the various presentations or the guests on the Space News episodes on the Thunderbolts Project uh, YouTube channel is that uh, it's not just, you know, physicists or it's not just cosmologists. I mean, you have electrical engineers, you have plasma physicists, you have cosmologists, you have people, electrical engineers. I mean, it's it's a wide group. It's a it's a group of people, you know, coming from very different backgrounds, whether educate, well, you know, education wise or otherwise. And, uh, yes, you know, it, kind of, it, kind of coming know, together. Uh, yeah, you'll notice also that there are classic scholars, there are artists, there are historians. Um, it covers everything, and this is what a real cosmology must do. It, it's not a specialty, just dealing with uh, what's out there in deep space. It has to include us, and that's the most important thing about the electric universe. We become central to the science, and everyone can get involved. And because the language comes back to normal, uh, English, <laughs> and I must say it's being translated into all other languages at present uh, at an increasing rate. Um, because it's simple everyday language, it's talking about uh, concepts that are recognisable by everyone. Uh, science becomes available to everyone. It's not sort of uh, cloistered uh, and um, uh, preached from a pulpit in Latin. It's um, it's available to everyone. And this is something that's happening. Garage experimenters are getting involved, testing planetary scarring scenarios, that kind of thing. And of course, the uh, electric sun uh, model was initially tested uh, simply in a, lab, uh, a small laboratory. Fascinating. Yeah, that's a, you know that's that's really positive to hear. It's it's much different than I remember my first uh, my first philosophy class in uh, in college, and uh, you know they introduced uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, uh, David Hume, and, and these other subjectivist philosophers that just you, you get into college and the first thing you hear is, uh, you know you can't you can't know anything. You can't even know this desk ahead of this desk in front of you actually that's exists. Right. Yes, How can you yeah. prove that? So that's a really disconcerting start. If like and, and the you know the the touted idea of college is you know it's you're there to learn. It's higher education, but you get in there. And you take a philosophy one on one class, and they tell you you can't know anything. So, like, where does that where does that leave the students? Uh, it doesn't leave them in a very good position. I think the philosophers shot themselves in the foot doing that. Um, <laughs> it's the natural <laughs> philosophers who were the important ones. <laughs> right, right. I, I I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So let's go ahead and get into, into some other stuff here. Uh, now, something often discussed. Uh, and I think uh, there's a presentation that you did, the long uh, understand, long, uh, uh, long understanding gravity, or something along those lines. And uh, so I guess let, let's talk a little bit about the, I guess the gravity centric model, which is uh, the mainstream model versus the the, the EU model. Uh, so uh, where do you want to start with that? Well, an understanding of gravity is uh, pretty much essential to understanding ourselves in the universe. I mean, the Big Bang. Uh, cosmology is essentially gravitational, but it's based on Einstein's mathematics, which has nothing to do with anything real. Um, and uh, it came from a, an attempt to try and understand how the electric force behaves in matter, because uh, all matter is essentially just charged particles uh, in acting in some resonant fashion to form atoms of, of various types and uh, also molecules and all of the things that we see. And th the problem with uh, mathematical theory of gravity is that it essentially uh, makes a, a point responsible for all the mass of the Earth. In other words, all the mass of the Earth resides at the center of the Earth. Well, this is impossibility. It doesn't look at how matter actually produces the gravitational force. It's, it's just a mathematical concept. And for that reason, any any discussion about how gravity behaves inside the Earth is bound to be wrong. Uh, and uh, also the actual, the way the gravitational force operates between bodies in the uh, universe is most likely wrong, simply because the theory, the mathematical theory bears no relationship to real matter. The electric universe just says, OK, you take an atom, it's made up of positive and negative charge, but that positive and negative charge cannot occupy the same space. They, it doesn't. We, we observe that. But when you have a positive charge and a negative charge separated by a small distance, it becomes a little electric dipole. OK, so the electric universe says, go one step down and look at an electron and a proton, the charged particles that make up matter. and what if they're made up of smaller charged particles also in orbit? And when you do that, you find out that 
the particles there can form tiny electric dipoles within the uh, electron and the proton as well. And it's that tiny, tiny distortion or tiny electric dipole inside subatomic matter that is actually the origin of gravity. Because when you have a whole lot of uh, particles that make up the Earth in this large body, then the gravitational force will tend to line all of these little dipoles up, just like having a whole uh, lot of uh, tiny bar magnets on a slippery surface on a glass tabletop, for instance. And if you shuffle them around, they'll all join north, south, north, south, north, south. In other words, they'll daisy chain. And it's that daisy chaining of that tiny, tiny force, which is the thing that holds us to the Earth, because it, our little dipoles are also lined up with the Earth's. And this gives you all sorts of uh, interesting <laughs> uh, uh, consequences. Right. Uh, one, of the, one of them is that every object in the universe actually has its negative pole facing outwards because all of the positive particles are much heavier than the uh, negative particles, the, le the electrons. The protons are nearly 2,000 times heavier than the electrons. And the result of that is that you always have the positive pole facing inwards in a body like the Earth and the Sun or any other body like that, and the negative pole facing outwards. And you think, hang on a minute, that means that all the bodies in the universe are repelling one another. And that, in fact, fits with the work of the astronomer who has been dubbed by those who understand him, the modern day Galileo, and that was Dr. Halton Arp. Right. And, and uh, he actually discovered on the basis of his uh, observational research, notice this isn't theoretical, this is observational research, that the redshift is not wholly related to the Doppler shift. And that these objects that are very faint and highly redshifted are not at the ends of the universe. They are nearby and faint because they are new. They have been uh, recently formed. Uh, I've been able to make sense of that from the electric universe. It's too complicated to talk about on radio. You need to have a diagram or two to help. Right. <laughs> but but it, it matches everything that Halton Arp found. And... Uh, I actually met Halton Arp uh, at our conferences, of course, the early ones, uh, around about uh, the year 2000, and I actually shared uh, the podium with him in uh, London in 2000, and we had lunch together. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to discuss all of these issues because he was off to uh, uh, meet uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, and uh, they were doing a film called The Cosmology Quest, which I recommend to anyone. Uh, just look it up on YouTube, The Cosmology Quest. Um, and that was the last time we saw Fred Hoyle. He died shortly afterwards. Anyway, there, there's these connections which I've been able to establish. And the electric universe has been a case of pattern matching. I look at the work of one scientist who I think is uh, on the frontier and is uh, doing good research. I try and piece it together with an, another scientist in a different field who's working at the frontier. And uh, this has served me very well because that has given birth to what I now call the electric universe. And there is no subject that is taboo. Any subject can be addressed uh, in this uh, new science. And this is as it should be. There are too, far too many taboos in science right now, things that you're not allowed to discuss, not allowed to research, and not allowed to fund. Right, right. So, so, so the implications of, and this is going to be some. You, you kind of already laid the foundation here. So, the implication from Halton Arp's findings is that, uh, because I, if, if I, if I understand it, uh, you know, uh, correctly, uh, the the redshift is the, those are supposed to be the, you know, the the quasars furthest away from furthest away from us. They are moving away from us at, you know, near the speed of light or something along those lines. Those are supposed to be the start of the mm. universe, right? So, this, what mm. what is this? What uh, what implications does this have on the Big Bang theory? The Big Bang never had a, a fiction. Um, <clears throat> it's based on the idea that the redshift alone signifies that things are rushing away from us faster and faster the further you look at, away from the Earth. Uh, and of course, that makes sense from that kind of um, rather naive interpretation. But in fact, it's not, I mean, we don't teach students that uh, Edwin Hubble felt that this was the least likely explanation for his discoveries. And yet, the, you know, they get, put Hubble up on a pedestal and this is typical. You have your heroes in science and uh, it's very difficult to dislodge them once you've done that. And it right. holds up progress in science. 
I mean, uh, a lot of these people have to be taken down from their pedestals and put, you know, in the back room at the uh, museum uh, because they are holding up, uh, worshipping their work is holding up science. Uh, the whole idea of the Big Bang is, uh, is just uh, a miracle. It's miraculous. It's a, a modern creation story dressed up with mathematics. Um, but it makes no sense at all because it involves the what somebody has called the ultimate free lunch. <laughs> right. You know, energy and matter from nothing. And there, you get into this uh, problem too of that there is no definition of energy in physics. Would you believe that? E equals mc squared is meaningless in physics because there's no definition of energy in terms of matter. And there's no definition of uh, uh, mass I mean, they've spent trillions on this Higgs boson experiment, the Large Hadron Collider, trying to find out why matter has mass. Well, E equals mc squared is it's the answer staring us in the face. <laughs> right. It's all about it's it's there, but nobody has taken the trouble to define. And this is where the philosophers come back in to define what you mean by energy and mass. And so one of the things I try and do in my uh, presentations uh, on the uh, thunderbolts.info website is to make it clear that I can define energy and mass in terms of matter. But it, it means discarding Einstein and his relativity because once you introduce relativity, you've lost your standards of measurement. Uh, right. And to define energy and mass, you must know what your standards of measurement are. Exactly, exactly. So, 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 guys, if you haven't noticed, this is going to be a, a whirlwind run through. Like I said, on the Thunderbolts.info uh, website and also the YouTube channel, there is uh, <laughs> enough content to keep you busy for, for a long time. I'm not going to, you know, lay out some arbitrary, uh, you know, time frame, uh, but uh, you'll, you'll be busy for, for, for a long time here. And, and, and with, what, with what you've kind of laid out there with, uh, say, the Large Hadron Collider and all of the money, the time, the effort put into uh, this study, uh, you know, of things that really don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you know, yeah. as, as you've kind of laid out, I mean, with with this fallacious study of, uh, of physics, I mean, what impact do you think that has on the evolution of humanity, technology-wise? Uh, I mean, how much how oh. much further would we be along by now if it wasn't for you know this this fallacious line of study? Yeah, I should mention the gravitational wave detector is another complete waste of money too, uh, because you don't there's no understanding of gravity. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> You have to understand gravity before you can talk about gravitational waves and then declare that you've found one. Um, th as far as technology is concerned, technology uh, is able to bootstrap itself so that when you uh, discover something that works in the laboratory, you then refine it and you produce either a new tool, a new measuring instrument or some new uh, device. And so technology uh, sort of bootstraps along without necessarily the science following or even in advance. In fact, the whole of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century can be the uh, the uh, technology that's used, the science that's used behind the new, this all of this technology was already there at the beginning of the 20th century. We've not produced anything really new in science in that time. The new instruments, of course, have been able to allow us to measure things better and better. And uh, of course, the scientists jump on that bandwagon and say, look what science has done for you. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, science has done very little for us. It's wasted a hell of a lot of money in the process. Yeah. Um, so uh, technology will take off with the electric universe because at last the engineers will have a model to work with. They'll know what they're dealing with. At present, quantum mechanics doesn't tell them what's going on. It's just a, a mystery. Uh, the very fact that cause and effect were disc discarded in um, uh, yes, yep. quantum theory means that you're just dealing with statistics, which doesn't tell you what's going on underneath. The electric universe attempts to provide you with a workable model, which the engineers can then look at and say, wow, I, th I think I can use this. <laughs> For instance, you know, if you understand gravity, there is the possibility of uh, defeating gravity and inertia, which is what UFOs appear to do. So there's an interesting thing to think about. Mm. Uh, and it means that you can go back and look at attempts to defeat gravity in the past and figure out, well, no, that wasn't the best way to do it because uh, it, it 
didn't understand what was actually going on at the base level. So technology can actually um, enter the realms of what you would expect of an advanced civilization in the universe. Right now, we're we're babes in the woods, and right. a lot of the a lot of the babies have been handed razor blades, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess uh, we've got about four minutes left on Truth Frequency Radio, and we can. Uh, I mean, I, I want to ask at least one question from uh, from uh, from one of uh, from one of one of my listeners here. So I have to do that uh, in uh, uh, mm. outside of TFR. So as always, guys, uh, for for listeners there, we don't have enough time. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast feed to catch the entire episode. Uh, so what so what are your thoughts on? Uh, and obviously, Elon Musk and uh, 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 Bezos from Amazon, they're trying to kind of, exp you know, do the private space exploration thing. Um, mm -hmm. Have you looked into kind of uh, what they're trying to do? Is there is their, uh, is their approach similar to mainstream physics? Uh, or are they kind of, uh, or, or I guess, do you, do you have any idea what their outlook is? Are they working with, uh, you know, I guess, advancing technology? Or is it still kind of the same, <coughs> the same sort of, uh, I guess, cycle? I'm not sure the best way to put that. No, they're hamstrung by the... Uh, technology available from the science of the uh, end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th. Uh, the technology, of course, can be achieved quite amazing things. And I take my hat off to the engineers. I think the engineers have done a phenomenal job of building all these things, the Large Hadron Collider, the gravitational wave detector, all these things are a technological uh, tour de forces, but they're not new science in, in that respect. Um, the electric universe uh, model taking a much bigger picture and showing our place in the universe much more clearly has things to say about the biology of uh, interstellar travel, interplanetary uh, colonization and things like that. We are tuned to the earth. We are earthlings. Now, if we try and colonize Mars, will we reproduce and produce Earthlings? And my answer is probably not. And we may be in for some surprises. It's not a case of, uh, you know, if we wear this planet out or, or mess it up, uh, we can go somewhere else and, uh, and proceed to mess that one up ad infinitum. That's not a, a solution. We have to learn to live as an integral part of the universe instead of trying to be apart from it. Uh, and just using it. Uh, so the electric universe is all about connectedness. Everything in the universe is connected. And what's more, in a subtle way, it is connected in real time. And this offers some suggestions to those who would like to communicate extraterrestrially with you know, phone ET. Well, you wouldn't use electromagnetism to communicate with any advanced civilization. And this is one of the reasons I think why we, we are unlikely to detect any uh, uh, intelligence using radio waves. I mean, it's, it doesn't make any sense if it takes you eight years to get a response from the nearest uh, neighborhood star. <laughs> uh, no, you'd have to do it in real time. And the universe operates at a, a, a very subtle level in real time. It's essential for life, it's essential for consciousness, it's essential for all of these things which are not addressed by Big Bang cosmology. Uh, and these are the kinds of things which will become clear if we attempt to do things like set up a colony on Mars or on the moon. We are an integral part of the Earth system uh, and it has all sorts of implications for long-term travel in space and uh, colonization elsewhere. We have to know more about life itself. Right, right. Uh, certainly, certainly interesting. So I guess one question, I guess, in that uh, space exploration, obviously there's, uh, you know, something touted, uh, you know, on those, uh, you know, the main, mainstream universe documentaries, uh, documentary series is uh, there's the, the idea that uh, you can't travel faster than the speed of light. Is that based off of the, you know, the, the current flawed model? Or uh, do you think that's true at all? It's based on Einstein's uh, work. Um, the, we, we notice that uh, particles traveling uh, in excess of the speed of light in uh, a medium uh, emit Cherenkov radiation, which means that there is energy transfer going on. Now, the problem that I see could be that, uh, the, to begin with, the first thing is that the electric universe, universe is not empty. 
this, the vacuum of space is not empty. It's full of a, a medium. Otherwise, you couldn't transmit radio waves through uh, or light waves through it. Mm -hmm. It has to have a dipole or a polarizable medium. And we know that because uh, the vacuum has the characteristics of a, um, a capacitor. You know, it has uh, the um, measurable characteristics of a medium, a dielectric medium. So it means that if you try and travel faster than the speed of uh, a radio wave or a signal through that medium, it could involve energy transfer, which may limit that, that possibility. This is something for the future. The electric universe points to the problem and we let the engineers look at it and see if they can figure out a way to uh, defeat it. Uh, but as for it being a limit on the transfer of information, it is not. It is not. The Earth, for instance, knows, has to know, all of the planets in the solar system have to know where each other is in real time. Otherwise, the system would fly apart. They cannot afford to be orbiting something uh, that is no longer there. It moved on, you know, <laughs> the sun moved on. Uh, hours ago, you cannot orbit that point, otherwise it's like swinging something around your head. Uh, without that string, the, the whole thing flies apart. And this, is, this has been pointed out by astronomers, but it's the kind of uh, information which is ignored simply because there is no simple answer to it without breaking a hallowed law of physics. And of course, once you've got Einstein up there on a pedestal, he has to be taken down before you can break that law. Right. Well, we, we've got to get over this kind of, um, uh, what would you call it? It's a belief system, you know, a belief system. And belief systems uh, shouldn't really be the fundamental aspect of your science. It holds you back. It stops you from investigating things. It means there are taboos about what you can talk about. All of these things hold science back. Indeed, indeed they do. All right. Well, so so one one thing I've noticed, especially uh, now that I actually have a, a decent understanding of the electric universe, right? I think uh, one thing I've I've started to do now is uh, you know actually kind of uh, you know try to start discussions on on outlets like Facebook, and I posted one a couple nights ago. Uh, uh, it was inflammatory, uh, sure, but I said uh, to to believe in the Big Bang is to is akin to believing in a cre in creationism. So I'm sure you can understand that that's uh, uh you know hurt some feelings, I guess, uh, at least to to, to some extent mm -hmm. or another. Now, one of those kind of taboo subjects, or I guess uh, something you're you're not allowed to disagree with, is global warming. Uh, there's this mm. uh, this idea of a scientific consensus. You know, the scientists have spoken, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, to question that is to uh, is to dissent. And they've come up with a lot of clever labels uh, for folks that uh, that do so. So one of these questions is from a is from a, a, a he was actually uh, with me in this uh, last in these last two episodes, the introduction to the electric universe and the uh, philosophic corruption of uh, physics. And uh, he has a, a question for you regarding uh, global warming. He says, quote, regarding the video global warming and our electric sun, Wall seems to have claimed that CO2 is a minor component to the phenomena of what is generally referred to as AGW, uh, anthropogenic global warming, or climate change. Uh, is he interested in expounding on CO2 or the fact that climate scientists don't seem to be aware of the electrical nature of weather solar impacts on climate, and other important aspects regarding the doomsday predictions that are so popular in TV movies and academia, end quote. So uh, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> the evidence uh, is that the carbon dioxide is a minor uh, component of uh, any kind of global warming, and uh, that water is the major one. But the, the thing is that they talk about climate models now, climate modeling is one of these theoretical approaches. We use computers, and of course, uh, with computers, if you tend to feed any garbage in, it will produce garbage out. And having spent a career in computing, I know all about that. And uh, also, these computer models have enough knobs to twiddle, and also the data input to these models can be suspect. So it's a pretty strange thing to be talking about you know certainties about global warming based on all of these uh, you know uncertainties 
But the chief factor from the electric universe point of view is that, as I said earlier about the sun, the en there seems to be energy coming into the sun, which is represented in the uh, million degree corona above a 5,000 degree uh, solar photosphere. That solar circuit was actually um, published decades ago by a Nobel Prize winning plasma physicist, uh, Hans Alfain. He is actually the father of what's called plasma cosmology because the universe is, um, the visible universe is largely plasma. And unfortunately, plasma is something that's rather difficult to uh, play with and we don't notice it much on Earth except in lightning bolts and, uh, and things like that. But he published a circuit for the sun and that circuit goes out from the equator, out to some distance, curves around, comes back in at the poles. He thought that the sun was a generator. Well, the electric universe looks at it as being connected to a larger galactic circuit. So it's more like a motor than a, a generator. And this can be, that uh, can explain the fact that the uh, equator of the sun rotates faster than the higher latitudes. In other words, it's being driven. Now that electrical energy that the sun receives also passes by the planets. So the planets are involved in that circuit as well. And one of the aspects of these uh, circuits is that they impinge on bodies at the poles in the form of auroras, but they also have circuits involving uh, ring currents around the bodies. And those ring currents can also uh, discharge into the upper atmosphere at mid latitudes in particular, and produce weather systems, rotating weather systems. Now, this is an energy source that doesn't appear in any computer model on climate change. Hmm. So you're missing uh, one major aspect of the electric universe and its impact on planets. Now, the fact that the planets, not just the Earth, but other bodies, Mars and that, were also were showing signs of uh, modified temperatures and uh, atmospheric conditions is also an indication that it has nothing to do with anything we're doing on Earth. It's, it's something that's um, associated with the sun and its environment. Now, the sun shines fairly steadily, and this is a puzzle in itself because the thermonuclear model gives you no reason to be uh, um, suspect that stars will shine steadily. In fact, the thermonuclear model is so unstable that uh, the night sky should look like the 4th of July with stars exploding everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Professor Don Scott, who's uh, a good friend and valued colleague uh, in the Electric Universe uh, movement, um, has shown that the photosphere of stars, bright stars, acts, has a transistor action. And that steadies, it uh, limits the current flow keeps it steady and it's the current flow in the photosphere which produces the heat and the light of the sun. Mm. Meanwhile, in x-rays, the sun is a variable star. It almost goes out at minimum and uh, is quite bright in x-rays at maximum, which shows that the power source of the sun varies and that variation is what drives the magnetic cycle of the sun as well. There's no explanation for the magnetic cycle in terms of the thermonuclear model. Right. It has to be sort of tacked on as another barnacle to that theory. Um, so, as I say, uh, climate science is misled. The, the experts in climate are misled by the experts in astrophysics. And this is typical. I mean, this is the specialization problem. Uh, each group of experts likes to appear as authorities in their subjects. And so, uh, scientists just down the corridor in another subject rely on the experts in this one to give them what they consider to be real mm -hmm. facts, the truth. You cannot rely on it. Experts overstate what they know and uh, what they understand. And this is a, a huge problem in modern science because there's nobody, no university on the earth that teaches the big picture and shows where all of these things are connected so that you can see the connections and the possibilities of real interdisciplinary activity. Right, right. now it's more in, in more in name than substance, interdisciplinary activity. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's 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 interesting because I I've I've been suspect even even before I even found out about the electric universe theory, I've been suspect of uh, you know global warming and climate change just because they they tend to change their minds a lot. They, it seems like they don't really know what's going on. And then second off, it seems like there's hmm. some sort of other agenda there that I'm not a big fan of. So I've been kind of skeptical yeah, think, of it. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that the language used is that of uh, a religion. You know, they're deniers. We have the ultimate truth. And anyone who says no is a denier. And the very fact that uh, they cook up these numbers about how many scientists uh, agree, it's meaningless. I mean, science isn't a democracy. It's a case of truth. You know, it's either true or it's false. And uh, you can't uh, determine that by a show of hands, especially when these questions are so politically charged. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I guess uh, you know I don't want to keep you for too too long. But this last question, I think, we'll end on a positive note here. Uh, mm -hmm. So, obviously, as 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 you know, we we've discussed so far in this episode, and that you've discussed many times in other in other uh, arenas. Uh, obviously, there's something very wrong with uh, with physics today. I think that's pretty that's pretty clear from our discussion. Uh, so, how how can we you know get scientists back on track to uh, the observational experimentational approach? I mean, how uh, how how can we do that if if you know that they're, they're they they have a model something uh, some evidence comes in that dis disproves that so without you know backtracking and figuring out okay where did we make this mistake they just invent a new concept like antimatter or something so how 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 can we you know I guess try to turn back turn back time you know revert to actual you know uh, I guess classical uh, uh, classical right. physics how, how how do we go about doing that I mean is it is what we're doing right now I mean uh, could you speak to that yes it's a case of uh, needing to go back to get to the future. <laughs> um, and it comes down to education. Our education system is aimed at producing people who just repeat what they've been told. It doesn't give you a correct historical uh, context for big decisions in the past uh, so that people can uh, compare and think for themselves about whether this idea appears to be right or wrong. Now, the education system doesn't give time for that. The history of science that's taught is just a, a children's fairy story, really. Um, it's been written by the winners and it's made to appear as if it's uh, logical and sensible. But of course, it sidelines some of the characters in the past who actually had better arguments than those that won. Uh, the winning of a an argument in science often boils down to personalities and politics rather than the science. Right, and, they and, talk then, the, about, and then the marginalization of the marginalization or complete exclusion, uh, you know, oh, from, yes. from the actual academic circles. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes. I mean, there's uh, evidence of um, you know scholars committing suicide as a result of the treatment they receive, and these um, universities and the politics within them are largely unaccountable. There is very, well, there's no, as far as I know, uh, investigative journalism in science as there is in politics. And there should be, because the politics in uh, in uh, academia can be cutthroat and uh, unaccountable. Right, right, yeah. And I guess one one person that uh, David Harriman talked about in his lecture was uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, and uh, it's it's and that was his intention was to it was it's a really depressing story to find someone who had just so much promise and was offering. I think it was Atomic Theory of Gases, what he was kind of you know I guess the laying mm -hmm. the foundation for. And yeah, he he just he couldn't take the battle anymore, so he he committed suicide. And and uh, kind of the the odd thing that happened after that, according to Harriman, is that they put up a statue in his honor once they accepted his theory. Uh, so oh yes, yes. They, re they rewrite history. <laughs> it's like Semmelweis and uh, you know the women dying in childbirth, and he said, well, you should wash your hands between the autopsy room and the uh, childbirth delivery room. Oh no, no, you know what's that got to do with it? And so he ended up committing suicide before they finally change their tune. This is typical, unfortunately, uh, because of uh, human nature. Human nature needs investigation and scientists, physicists, should be taught human psychology to, so that they can see, understand what it is they're doing and maybe change their ways. Right, right, and, and and I will say, you know, with with the advent of the internet, uh, you know, I think this is, I think this is, this might be an issue that, uh, you know, at least is mitigated, you know, uh, at least to a certain point, mm -hmm. because like with the electric universe theory, if this would have been, and it was kind of proposed, uh, I guess maybe in primitive form by by various scientists, but they had to, you know, yes. do papers and write letters, and with kind of the electric universe now with the Thunderbolts project, 
uh, the ability to reach people is so much greater. So there's not this isolation. Uh, there's a bunch of people working together to try to figure out what's going on. I think that's going to be a re play a really positive and big role uh, in the future as uh, as uh, you know, hopefully, you know, as on a positive, uh, I guess, uh, note out. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, the science science will uh, will correct itself at some point. But then again, you got to think about uh, mm -hmm. kind of the, all of the time and money that's been wasted in the meantime. Yeah, I think science is self-correcting only in a very trivial sense uh, between paradigm shifts. The paradigm shift for the electric universe, which must happen for our future or to have a future, uh, will require that we actually do the impossible, uh, do these experiments and show that what was thought to be impossible is possible. And that's the only way that uh, we will uh, do it, have a breakthrough. Uh, attacking academia through trying to publish papers is a waste of time because the peer review system prevents you from doing that. Um, uh, so you, it's really a case of appealing to the public, the curious public, and let them decide for themselves. It, it's a case of getting people to think and think about what they're being told on television and all these uh, science media shows and comparing it with what uh, we are saying and then allow your own intelligence to uh, make the decision. Right, right. And, and for the listeners out there, you know, ed education doesn't end in high school. It doesn't end uh, once you graduate from college. Uh, Absolutely it never not. <laughs> it never ends. And uh, so, I mean, I, I would really implore if, you, if, if you're listening to this podcast anyways, I mean, that, that's kind of the, the mindset that you already have. But I'd, I'd really recommend, you know, outside of government itself, you know, apply kind of that same that same skepticism and that same, you know, explorator, explorative mind uh, into investigating other spheres of human experience, because uh, it's not just isolated government. I mean, the, the science science is so, so bastardized now and it needs to get back to that classical physics approach where where, you know, you know people understand that, well, we can know. Uh, objective reality we can't understand the universe it's not this uh, extremely and yeah sure it's, it's complex in some some ways but it doesn't be as complex as, as uh, the, the mainstream model uh, uh, desires it to be so so all any closing thoughts before i let you go well people who come to our conferences uh, are so enthusiastic at, uh, that they say that it's changed their lives it is an inspiring adventure for those who are willing to uh, think outside the box and to compare ideas and uh, consider what the future might really hold for us. Indeed, indeed. Well, Walt, uh, Walt, thanks so much for you know coming on to the podcast. It was a great discussion. Hopefully, we can have you back on in the future. There's just too much to cover in uh, in an hour or so. Uh, but I, I certainly appreciate you you coming on and talking. It was uh, I, I've been watching your stuff for a few years now, so it was it was an honor to chat with you. And I just want to thank you so much for all the all the work that you're doing. Uh, to advance the electric uh, universe theory and uh, and you know actually you know tr try to get back